Hello everybody, welcome back to No Trailers Allowed, my movie and streaming show podcast where I do not watch trailers beforehand. I'm your host, Jersh. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find more episodes on my website, superjersh.com. You can support me and get this podcast early and ad-free by visiting patreon.com slash superjersh. The video version of this podcast is available on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash superjersh. You can follow me on social media uh, on Twitter and Instagram at superjersh. If you want to email me to be a part of the show with your questions, comments, or suggestions, the email address is no trailers allowed at gmail.com. I want to give a quick Patreon shout out and welcome new patrons Truth Teller, Dan, and Andrea. And thank you, Patreon executive producers Mirrors, Tris, I Love Manatees, and Daryl. Thank you, legendary Patreon producer Zell Binion. On this episode, I'm going to talk about Jackass Forever and Tick, Tick, Boom. I'm going to talk about Jackass first, and that's going to be spoiler-free. After that, I'll talk about Tick, Tick, Boom, and that's going to be full spoilers. The movie's been streaming on Netflix for several weeks, or actually maybe even a couple of months now, so I'm not going to worry about doing a spoiler-free section, but I'll remind you of that when I get to that. So let's talk about Jackass. So can't talk about Jackass without talking about my history with Jackass. Um, I definitely feel like I grew up in the Jackass generation. Um when those uh i don't i'm trying to remember it wasn't clips it wasn't youtube it just was going to my friend's house uh who had mtv and uh being able to see some episodes of jackass when we were older and uh yeah loving the show talking about the show all the time to the extent that me and my best friend who sadly passed away that I talk about all the time because I think about it all the time uh we did our own bullshit with a camcorder dressing up in animal suits and walking into the library and climbing into the sewers in our town and going up on the roof of buildings at night and think really stupid jackass shit uh nobody ever got hurt and never really got too serious the our interest our sense of humor was the more the comedy aspect, not the risk of injury or the pain aspect. It was, you know, the prank, the surprise, getting the look on somebody's face if you showed up, uh, you know, in a library in a, in a giant cow suit. Um, and so that, you know, there was a couple of months of our lives where we were kind of obsessed with, like, making funny things uh, on the camcorder that I saved up and bought with my own money. Um I loved the first Jackass, saw it in theaters. It was a very funny, memorable experience. I think I think my friend that passed away and my brother who passed away, I think we're both there. So we definitely, uh, you know, I, I definitely uh, just appreciate the series overall. Uh, and re I remember loving Jackass 1. I have not seen it in a long time. Jackass 2 uh, is when I started to maybe fall off and get a little bit older and not follow it as closely. I think I caught it on video a couple of years after it was released. And I remember just thinking, like, this is too much. It's too violent. It's too mean-spirited. It's not even, like, like they literally just want to hurt each other. And um, so that one, it wasn't as fun for me as the first one was. Jackass 3, uh, I really, really love um, because it had... Uh, it was able to do two things. It was able to still do a lot of crazy stunts in, and now in the HD era and the slow-mo era with the Phantom Cam at 10,000 frames per second. And they were older. And time had passed since the other Jackass movie where it had been almost like 10 years or 8 years or something like that since they had shot one. So they were all in their 40s. So you kind of got, you know, the older versions of them doing still kind of insane stunts, which kind of brings me to Jackass Forever, which had another 10-year gap. Um, the information that I have shows that they started filming it proper at the beginning of January 2020, and Jackass 10 came out in 2010. So almost 10 years exactly, And but they had to stop filming because of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um the other thing that I'll say, too, is that uh, I know that there's, like, a lot of drama around Bam Margera's involvement. I only know what little bit of information I've read online. Apparently, he's having some pretty 
uh, rough substance abuse issues allegedly, and uh, has you know taken. They had one one of their crew, one of the Jackass crew, Ryan Dunn, sadly passed away, you know, in a drunk driving car accident, and um, you know that kind of wrecked their crew, which I understand. I've lost people as I've already mentioned, so it can wreck you and it can take a lot of time and life from you. And so I just hope that he gets better. I my understanding is that they had put restrictions on him to help him with his sobriety to keep him in the movie, and he unfortunately failed. The substances got the better of him. And they had no choice but to remove him from the movie. And he filed some lawsuit, but they either settled or it got dismissed because the movie came out. He is, I did know, I did see him in one scene for half a second. I, I noticed him and it is kind of amazing how he looks now, because I haven't seen him in a really long time, uh, how much he looks like Phil because he's gained weight and is older. And it just, it looks like the spitting image of Phil. It's like when he was young, he looked like his mom and now he looks like his dad. It's kind of crazy just to, See the passage of time and, and what it does to people. Um, so Bam's not in it. It's it's Johnny Knoxville, Steve-O, Wee Man, Chris Pontius, Party Boy, um, Danger Aaron, and, and Dave England are kind of like the main old school folks. And then there are um, there's some new people that joined the crew as well. Um, I don't I don't uh, I don't know their nicknames. They go by they don't necessarily go by credited names, but um, Preston Lacey was also in it. Rachel Wolfson, Eric Manaka, Zach Holmes, which they call Zach Ass, which is fucking awesome. Um, yeah, and uh, I would say that that um, Jackass Forever is a really good time. I laughed really hard. My face hurt from laughing. Um, the opening sequence, which again, I I, I won't, I'm I'm not going to spoil anything. Again, I didn't see the trailer, so I didn't know. What was the tone of this movie going to be? Was it going to be um, the balance of pain and prank like the first one? All pain like the second one? M maybe lean into more of the nostalgia and prankster style of the third one that had a little bit less pain and a little bit more prank focus? Um, and I, this one definitely, I would say <laughs> it's a mixture of both, but it's extreme versions of both. Like the pain that they cause to their bodies. Um both the, the men and women, they, it's just, it's like uncomfortably, it's uncomfortable, but you laugh because it's it's happening to somebody else. It's not happening to you. Um, but yeah, the opening sequence of the movie had a tone of just like, this is for, this is for kids. This is not, uh, this definitely isn't my sensibility and my attachment to these guys, especially as I've grown older. Like this joke, this opening sequence like really didn't work for me and it had me scared that I wasn't going to like the movie. I was like, "Oh no, it's not going to be all just like 13-year-old juvenile shit, is it?" And when I say juvenile, I mean like their pranks and their thought behind their pain or and what they do for pain actually has a lot of thought behind it. They've had like really complex pranks in the past where they'll double twist it on people like you'll think you're helping to prank somebody else but you're actually getting pranked. And uh, so there actually is a lot of bit of thought that goes into the setups for the pranks and the pain moments. And the first one was just like so like first idea you spit out of a brainstorming session of, of just like, what if we did this? And it's like they never thought of something better. So I don't know. Anyway, opening sequence didn't work for me. But once it got past the opening sequence and it got to seeing the guys together, seeing the new crew, getting into the stunts, getting into why you're there, that was all really good, and I was instantly having a good time, and it never slowed down. Like, it just moves from one bit to the next. This is this is the setup, this is what we're going to do, this is the results, here's the next one, you know? And there's little interstitials in the way, or on the way, as far as, like, um, you know. There wasn't as many running gags, like, in the past they've had... I think the taser and the buzz clipper, and it looks like from some of the from some of the uh, footage, it looks like they, or from some of the clips in the movie, it looks like they had a longer running gag with a lot more victims, but maybe they didn't get the reactions that they want to keep it going. So you only see one or two moments of those instead of like an ongoing, consistent long running gag. But uh, it was very good. I would say I, I have mixed feelings about how the main core kind of step back for like the first half of the movie. I mean, they're in their fifties now, which is crazy to think about. Um, and so I understand 
why they let kind of the young blood take the brunt of it. Um, the young blood and Danger Aaron. I think this is maybe Danger Aaron's most insane contribution to this franchise. And that's saying a lot considering everything he's done for them. <laughs> um, but uh, as the movie went on, because I mean, when the movie starts, it's like, I'm here to see the jackass guys do jackass stuff. I don't, I've never, I never heard of any of the other people in the movie. I, I never heard of them before. But as the stunts go on and you get a feel for their personalities and their, you know, their love for the, both the jackass guys and like the chase for footage willing to do anything and put themselves on the line, you know, just as strong or crazy as the original cast, they, they do kind of win you over over the runtime. So that first kind of hesitation of, I don't know, I don't know this group, so I don't know if I'm into this group because uh, I do have such a long uh, and fond attachment to the original jackass guys that I was nervous about that, but they definitely won me over. So um, as, as the movie went on, it, it kind of got even better because the new personalities started winning me over. And then the old uh, original crew started to actually do more as the movie went on. And uh, yeah, overall, it's pretty much everything that, that you want in a jackass movie because uh, it just makes you laugh. And that's literally what it's there to do. And um, it also, it was like 95 minute movie. It, it was a breeze to watch. It's probably going to be easily rewatchable just because of some of the moments that, that were captured. Again, I, I did watch the trailer after I saw the movie, and unfortunately, a lot of the main setups and bits are given away. I mean, you see like 20, 20 or 25 setups in that trailer, and it's only a 90-minute move, a 90-minute movie. So I mean, they're giving away a lot. Um, but thankfully, the payoffs are not in the trailer, and they're definitely worth seeing because like the reactions and what happens and who gets injured and who falls from ranks and things like that. It just was a very fun time, which is exactly what you want uh, out of a Jackass movie. So I would say probably like an 8 out of 10 for me, just because I wanted to, see, I did want to see a little bit more of the uh, original crew uh, for the first half of the movie. Some of the body pain is like really kind of excruciating and I'm wondering like what are we doing here do you real is this do do why do you guys think it's funny it's happening to you you know I know why I'm laughing it's not happening to me anyway jackass forever definitely great if you missed it or miss it in a theater run because it's not in theaters long because of the pandemic I just as a reminder in case you haven't heard the podcast before but I'm triple vaxxed I'm, I'm double vaxxed and boosted I wear a mask in the theater and I pick showings that are kind of during the day with very low oftentimes I'm in the movies by myself or single digit people in there so uh, I feel pretty safe when I go and when I choose to go and, and if you choose to go do the same thing otherwise if you uh, it's definitely worth uh, watching at home when it becomes available on streaming Did you know that if you support me on patreon.com slash you can get this podcast early and ad-free? You probably didn't know that because you're listening to this promotion right now. Which means you also probably didn't know that there are dozens of hours of Patreon-exclusive content over there, like full album music reactions and full movie watch-along commentaries. So head on over to patreon.com slash to help the music and movie discussions continue. And for you gamers out there, don't forget to check out my gaming-focused YouTube channel, youtube.com slash jershplays. Recently I've been focusing on Guild Wars 2, Overwatch, and Fortnite, but there are also dozens of hours of gameplay videos for single-player games like Detroit Become Human and the Resident Evil series. Subscribe to that channel ASAP. It's free and helps a lot. Speaking of free, if Patreon isn't your thing, make sure you are liking the posts, commenting, sharing, rating, and reviewing, and subscribing everywhere that you can if you enjoy anything that I produce, music, movie, or gaming related. The only way it can continue is with your help. If this is all too much to remember and you want to see the different types of content I'm producing all in one place, just visit my website, superjersh.com. Tick, tick, boom. Uh, was directed by Lid manuel Miranda and stars Andrew Garfield. Uh, this is going to be a full spoiler talk uh, review. The movie has been on streaming for a couple of months now, and I want to be able to talk about my thoughts freely. I do absolutely recommend watching it. Uh, not everything worked for me in the movie, um, but there was a very strong performance by the lead uh, actors, specifically uh, Andrew Garfield and Robin DeJesus, I think was his name. Um... 
to react to this cast really quick. Yeah, Andrew Garfield, Alexander Ship, and Robin DeJesus. I, I loved all of their performances. Uh, and uh, the movie, it's like an hour and 45 minutes. It, it's a very... Um, I don't want to say that. It's It's definitely worth watching. I am very glad that I watched it, even though it's not perfect. And I do recommend it. If you do not want to have it spoiled for you, go watch the movie, then come back. It's definitely worth watching. Um, so last full spoiler warning for Tick, Tick, Boom. So as a reminder, I do not watch trailers here. So I did not know uh, anything about this movie except um, what I glanced at in the blurb when I pressed play on Netflix, which was Andrew Garfield, uh, composer, trying to finish a musical, right? And that's it. I didn't know anything else. I didn't know who else was in the movie. I didn't know if it was going to be a full-on musical or if it was about trying to make a musical. I didn't know if it was based on real life or fictional. I didn't know who lives, who dies, who tells your story. Okay, like I, I had no clue. So um, what I will say is that the framing device of the tick, tick, boom kind of, one, to my knowledge, um, the... Uh, the show Tick, Tick, Boom by Jonathan Larson was like a one-man show that he produced in 1992 after uh, Superbia flopped. Um, and again, I don't, I don't, I, when I'm in full spoiler mode, I'm not giving you a plot synopsis because I don't want to waste your time. But um, I'm assuming you've watched the movie. So apparently that's a, he, apparently. Andrew Larson is a real life character. And I want to kind of, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to jump to the end. I want to go through my journey with this movie. So the movie opens. And it's this kind of you know bombastic theater kid, really catchy song. Probably my favorite song in the whole movie was Thirty Ninety. I just, I loved the lyrics and the melody and the energy, and it has a lot of the cast all singing together, and it really showcases that Andrew Garfield is uh, not here to fuck around. He actually learned to sing <laughs> for this musical. I don't know if he's actually playing the piano. I feel like in, in La La Land, which is probably going to get brought up a lot uh, wherever you hear about this movie, um, I feel like in La La Land, they made it a point to show that Ryan Gosling was playing the, the piano and had learned the piano because there are a lot of long moving takes where it goes up to Ryan Gosling's face and down his arms onto the keys and then wide shots where you can see it's all Ryan Gosling and he's all playing the, you know, he's doing it all himself. And this movie specifically really only shows like extreme close-ups and inserts uh, of the playing. And anytime you see Andrew Garfield singing, you don't see him actually playing. I feel like that would have been uh, kind of celebrated and maybe even slightly pandered to like La La Land to show that like he went all the way. Um, you know, similar to like Bradley Cooper learning guitar and writing songs on guitar and learning to sing for A Star is Born. Um, but right away I was like, okay, dude can sing. We've got a catchy song here. Um, what, you know, what's this movie going to be about? And uh, as I was watching the movie, I was really frustrated with the storytelling framing device. Number one, at the start, the voiceover narration tells you that he's dead, that we lost him. And I didn't know that. And I immediately thought of Hamilton and how the beginning of Hamilton tells you that, you know, these people died. We died for him. We loved him. Aaron Burr shot him. Like, why are you give, telling all of the details to the story at the top of the story? Don't tell me. Because if you already know, then you already know, Right. If you don't know, then it just ruins that information for you. So I really don't understand that ever in a stage or film, the point of here are the big emotional impact things that happen in what you're about to see. Hope they're still emotionally impactful. You know what I mean? Like, in the most, most cases they are, I just think it's an even more rewarding experience to be surprised while you are getting emotional instead of like, oh, that's when the thing's going to happen because they told me, oh no, you know what I mean? Um... And I also didn't know, uh, from a musical perspective, when you see directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda, which this is his uh, directorial debut, um, I just maybe I just assumed he wrote the music. I didn't know that it was actually about another musician and he just happened to direct it because of probably his attachment to the material and the history of theater. But so we get first we get get it spoiled that uh, he's no longer with us. 
and we get a um like just a ton of exposition because this what this one man this one man show is is like loosely or majority based on his real life and his struggles of trying to get his last big musical all the way to production and how it failed and um so you're literally like as it cuts back and forth between the dramatized like the movie the actors acting and in the apartment and going to work and and struggling with his relationship and trying to finish the last song for superbia which he hasn't written yet um we get constant updates from the one man stage show and at, at the time as i'm watching it on a first watch i'm frustrated because i'm like this exposition is ruining the flow of the movie like i was in the movie and now we're back to the one man show like i thought felt like it should have been one thing or the other but as i got to the end and as i looked up kind of spoilers and information about this guy and his uh contributions to theater and how much of it was based on real life and that Tick, Tick, Boom was like a real show. Like the other thing is when I first saw the title Tick, Tick, Boom, I immediately thought of lyrics from Hamilton, Click, Click, Boom. And I thought uh, like the reason that I didn't watch this right away when it came out, when I saw that it had come out, because I saw that it was directed by Lin-Manuel Miranda. It was called Tick, Tick, Boom, and it was about a musician. And I thought it was like going to be this autobiography. I thought it was like Lin-Manuel Miranda telling the Lin-Manuel Miranda story. And I was like, I don't, I don't need to see that right now. Anyway, um, what else do I want to say about the movie? Um, I love I loved those main performances, and I think the Andrew Garfield uh, Robin De Jesus relationship was probably the strongest, even more stronger than his relationship with his girlfriend, which had a realistic flow to it. And uh, I I believed the trajectory that the relationship took. Um, even though things happen in real life, doesn't mean you're going to buy it in a movie. I mean, they sold it, they built it up and they sold it in the movie that they were really good together. And then the reasons why they couldn't make it work out. Um, yeah, Andrew Garfield was awesome. Um, uh, not just in the singing, but in the acting and especially, especially when you get to the end credits and they show you clips and glimpses of the person in real life, that like retroactively made me appreciate his performance even more because he really had it down. The head bobbing and the curly hair flailing and the smiles behind the keyboard. It just like was, holy shit. He like really pulled that off, you know, the energy and the singing and, and everything. Um, yeah, as I was, as I was watching the movie and the AIDS epidemic was growing more and more apparent, um, I was like, is this okay so first i was like this is like team america world police okay we're gonna go off on a little tangent here i've never seen rent i've never seen the stage play the film version i just know through osmosis and cultural relevance that it's about a lot of people getting aids and i didn't know that when i saw team america world police so in team america world police um when <laughs> when the puppet is singing in the musical lease and the song is everyone has aids i just laughed at that because i can't believe there this is a song i didn't know that it was a send-up of rent because i'd never seen rent i just was laughing because a puppet singing everyone has aids is inherently offensively funny um which that's south park uh and so after it's like after team america came out i think the the rent movie was announced and that's when i started to hear about rent and then i retroactively appreciated the gag in team america any even more anyway um so i was aware that i'm vaguely aware of like that's kind of one of the main uh dramatic points of rent and as the movie was going on i was like jesus christ this feels like rent right this has to be this has to have something to do with rent i didn't know i genuinely honestly didn't know i was like this has to have something to do with rent because all these people are having aids and he's a theater kid and he's in new york and it, you know what i mean like it just kind of adds up um so the i guess one of my biggest problems with the movie is uh not all of the music was particularly catch up catchy or memorable for me I, I again i think the opening song is the best song and i don't think you necessarily want that in a I consider this a musical it has like the majority of the music does happen in, in the one man stage 
play, which I say one man stage play because in the trivia and the information that I looked up about the show, it was just, uh, I keep wanting to call him Andrew. <laughs> um, it was just Jonathan Larson and like one or two other performers helping him tell this story. But in the movie, they got like everybody in the cast and backing vocals and made it like a full show to be able to do full songs. Also, Vanessa Hudgens is in this movie, which is a name I've heard before. I know that she's famous. I just don't know if she's an actor or a singer. Um, but I did look up after the fact, or I found out after the fact, that she was kind of the main lead in all of the per singing performances for Jonathan. So she's the one doing the, the therapy duet with him. She's the one singing with him on stage with, with 3090. And she's the one that like uh, kind of headlines and or co-headlines the final song that he finally wrote uh, for Superbia with Alexander Ship. Um, I would say, I've said it before that like, um, I care about movie structure and I care about plot and uh, I'm okay with character pieces and character study pieces, but I genuinely also would, I would prefer a compelling plot as well, you know? And my problem with the plot in this movie is the problem that Jonathan has in the opening 15 to 30 seconds of this movie, I need to write this song for my play before I turn 30, is the same problem that he has an hour and 20 minutes into the movie from like a plot conflict perspective. From a character perspective, yes, the relationships change and evolved. He kind of butts heads with his friend Michael who has the big time corporate job. And uh, he, of course, uh, strains his relationship with his girlfriend because of his attachment to the ma to the material and wanting to finish the musical. Um, so there is some like interpersonal conflict, but like the protagonist's goal in the opening thirty seconds is the same up to like ninety minutes in, and then it kind of changes, and then there's like a progression, a change of conflict, a change of focal point in like the last twenty minutes of the movie or whatever. And so I did find myself, you know, wanting more kind of twists and turns or exciting things. Now, again, this is me not knowing anything, not knowing it's based on real life, not knowing. Uh, this is me just letting the movie speak for itself. Um, in hindsight, I actually do understand why it has the format that it has for both the stage show of the Tick, Tick, Boom and the focusing on the um, the writing of that song. Because... You know, again, similar to La La Land and Whiplash and Inside Lewin Davis and, and to some extent Black Swan, not that extreme, I suppose. But it is about, you know, the struggle of the artist, the struggle of the creative person, whether it's music or filmmaking or painting or, you know, poems, writing, whatever, of, um, you know, focusing on this one thing and being good enough and... Uh, how it can, you know, negatively sever or impact your personal relationships. It's almost impossible to maintain both a healthy, driven, professional, creative pursuit and a healthy, emotional uh, relationship with your family and friends, you know. And for me personally, for people who don't know my story, I went to film school. I've written and directed independent films. And I can say that, yes, I... You know, I really identified with this character, you know, similar to how I identified with Inside Lou and Davis of just like forcing yourself to make creativity happen, that that's what matters, that that's what's special. Anybody can go find a day job. Not everybody can write and direct a movie. Not everybody can write music. Not everybody can come up with these story ideas and these character ideas and these surprises that entertain and maybe potentially inspire. You know, like I do think that this is like, a very inspiring movie because it gives you a lot to chew on, especially if you're a creative person. Like, am I like that? Because he's a pretty self-absorbed guy, worried about turning 30, which again, in hindsight makes sense, but in the moment feels a little overdramatic <laughs> uh, because you can write songs after 30, um, traditionally. Um, and he's very self-absorbed with, I need my song, I need my song, I need my song, you know? And what about the people around you? Don't they need, what about their song? You know, it's like, he says he cares about all of his talented friends, but really it's about, I need this musical to happen, you know? And so as a viewer, I ask myself, like, how much of myself do I see in this person? Do I like that? What parts of him are good and what, what parts of him are bad? And I appreciate about the movie that this was not, you know... <laughs> tick tick boom as told or as told by the hero jonathan larson like 
He he um, is negligent towards his relationships and in his friendships and his romantic relationship, and um, you know he pays the price for that. And you know it's it may or may not have been worth it. You know what I mean? Like I definitely personally, um, when I made my movies, I picked a really rough time in my life to make movies. I made my first movie when I was a new parent. And I made my second movie when I was going through a divorce. So, uh, and then I made my third movie, which is was probably my uh, easiest movie to make. Um, I didn't, I was not happy with some of the footage that I had shot and I wasn't able to capture some of the footage that I had shot. And I wasn't happy with the tone that I was finding in the original edit. So I had to dub it which means I had to bring actors back, you know, a year after we had finished the damn thing or finished shooting it because I finally got, you know, an, a cut of it mostly edited and realized it, it wasn't working the way that I wanted. Now I'm really happy with it. It's a love it or hate it, you know, divisive kind of movie where you either are in on the joke and have fun watching it um, or you can't pay attention for more than five minutes because a dubbed movie doesn't work for you. That's fine. But, and then I made a fourth movie right before the pandemic started that I was really proud of and really happy with. But then a, another person screwed me over. So it's like I screwed myself over with my timing and decision making in the first three. And then somebody else screwed me over when I really did. Uh, I felt like everything that I could write. Um, but what I did do throughout the process of me making those movies is um, Definitely, I definitely prioritize them over everything else except my son. Um, I, my, you know, I just, I love being a parent. I love being my son's dad. That is, has always been priority <laughs> numero uno. Um, what's funny is, and again, I, I'm sharing the this information because it relates to this movie and this story and this character. And these are kind of the thoughts an emotion that I brought to the movie. Before my son was born, I had lost all of my creative drive. I was in a relationship. I had a decent day job. And I literally, I went to work, I watched Netflix, and I played video games. And I did that for like seven years. I never wrote any stories. I played some guitar riffs and messed around on guitar, but never did anything with them and and um, never really challenged myself to do more. That's one of the reasons why I'm so limited in my musicianship is because I'm self-taught and I never tried to teach myself anything more than what I already had learned a long time ago because it's just a hobby. It's nothing I took seriously, but I was just very complacent in existence and in life. And... Uh, when my son was born, that changed, you know, when you become a parent, it changes you. And I feel like my story is the reverse of what you would expect. I think what you would expect if either in real life with people that you know, or in movies that you've seen is that before a child is born, you're running around like an idiot, making movies, doing, not holding down a job, not taking things too seriously because nobody depends on you. You can feed yourself. You're fine. And that's when you're kind of effing around and finding your way in life and doing things um, that are not that it's OK if you fail because you're nobody needs you. Um, and then when you have a, a, a kid, you sh you shape, you know, you shape up, you get serious, you find that desk job and you put the the video camera away and you put the guitar down and you say no more time for silly dreams it's time to be a parent you know i've known i i have known people in my life that have like had that trajectory and i've seen it plenty of times in different entertainment forms and like that's what you hear all the time it's like it's time to grow up that kind of thing and i had this kind of reverse effect where i had the day job wasn't there wasn't a creative ounce of energy in my body and Maybe I was, I took life less seriously. I was a little bit more, more immature having the stable job. And then when my son was born, it just, something changed in me. You know, I assessed my life and what I was doing. And I just was like, 
this is barely good enough for me. It sure as hell isn't good enough for him. Like, I have to try. Even if I fail, I have to try. So that way, he has the courage to try. You know, whether it is go all in, all in on some sort of creative pursuit, or even if it's just maintaining a day job and pursuing a creative uh, passion. I, you know, I needed to, like, live that life to prove it to myself and to my son when he grows up that um, it's possible that it's worth chasing things down. <clears throat> so that first movie, it was 40, 40 to 45 hours a week in the day job. And then it was taking care of my son any, any other time around that, you know, in the morning after, after work, picking him up and taking care of him, you know, just a baby. And then uh, at, in the evenings and on the weekends, it's shooting a movie, right? And so it just, <clears throat> it's not possible. So it's like I made time for my son and literally nobody else, like nobody. You know, if you heard from me, it's because I needed something because I needed help with my movie. Do you have this location? Do you have this wardrobe? Um, do you have this camera? Do you have extra lights? Whatever, right? And it, in the moment, it felt kind of altruistic. I'm doing what everybody wants to do. People should be proud of me. I'm chasing a dream and people are helping me do that and I'm making memories with all these people that they're going to have for the rest of their lives. Um, but similar to... Jonathan Larson, I think in hindsight, there was a better way to do that. There was a more balanced way to do that, to be sincere in a passionate pursuit and to balance the relationships, you know? Part of my pressure, part of me putting my pressure on that self in that time period was to make sure that the movie got made. A lot of indie films fall apart. A lot of people fluff off. Actors drop out, say never mind, or uh, move away, you know? And so... You know, we had a three-month shooting schedule on the first movie. And I was like, if I don't get this done in three months, it's not going to get done because uh, I either won't be able to, or I'll lose a location, or somebody will not be in. I was worried about it. Um, you know, but, but I should have just, I don't know, scheduled it differently. But that's what I appreciate this movie for is, um, you know, sincerity with that struggle um, it's based on real life, so it's not like the La La Land made up Hollywood version. Um, the last thing that I want to say kind of about this movie and, and the structure and the way that information was received is that the fact that this man passed away from a brain aneurysm like the night before Rent, which he wrote after his failure, um, you know, after, or the night that before it premiered for preview showings, is just cruel. It just shows you how cruel that life is and, and the universe is and how indifferent it is to your dreams and wants, you know? Um, so that information did wreck me, but how I think it could have been delivered in a more uh, emotionally... Um, uh, meaningful way. Uh, it was just a line of expositional dialogue. It literally was, and then Poochie went home to space. And it literally was the end of Unbreakable. Like, it just was. Um, and then he died. Do you know what I mean? And it's just like, it just felt like it did a disservice to him and, and a di disservice to the drama of that moment. Maybe they didn't want to come off as over-manipulative, but it's a theater movie about theater kids and drama and emotional you know, emotional hyperbole, like, it feel, I, I feel like, like, a proper scene, or, or a proper finding out, or the friends, at least seeing the friends find out, I think, I feel like that would have been appropriate, and not um, distasteful, it could have been done tastefully, because this movie was really well made, I liked the sequences in it, I liked uh, the camera work in it, it was, it was smooth, and full of energy, and there was a lot of fast cuts, and editing during some of the musical numbers, that I thought really worked to give it an energy to, during the therapy song, especially, I'd say 3090 and therapy are definitely my top two. I also really loved the juxtaposition of the Michael character in the opening of the movie saying, you know, it, they can't believe this is real life. Is this real life? I can't believe I have this sweet apartment and I have all this money and I'm so successful. It's too good to be true. Is this real life? And then at the end, when Michael gets the HIV uh, diagnosis and the world is falling apart and Jonathan's world is falling apart and they're sad together, 
then we have that kind of sad song of the sad version of is this real life like it's so it's so bad i can't believe it's happening so i really loved the double use of is this real life it's so good i can't believe it's happening and it's so bad i can't believe it's happening and those are kind of the extremes in life that we have to deal with unfortunately um yeah so i did like this movie i, I liked it more after i learned more though you know when i first finished it i was like well that was a clunky exposition strange musical with not a ton of memorable songs um and i didn't like the way they delivered the ending information but uh, once i looked into you know found out about more about the facts of what happened and kind of confirmed what they had said that it was true um and i just reflected on my life more um yeah i really liked it and and that thought i do i do again because i've lived it because i've kind of i kind of have lived that chase the dream no matter what and it wrecks you know, your personal life. I don't know how sold I am. I don't know where I fall on chasing your dreams anymore. I really don't. Because if I never had done that, like, I just probably objectively would have a better life right now. You know what I mean? Like, because I would have had a, you know, a better, longer, more stable job. I wouldn't have severed or lost relationships that severed and were lost. And I would, um, yeah, you know, like, I I do I actually believe that my life is worse because I made movies, <laughs> um, which is why it's really hard for me to kind of get the gumption and the courage and the um, the desire to do it again because it's like oh no it'll just get worse because now I'm actually in a pretty good place um, because I took I took the chance on going creative full time and even if it's not sustainable and it ends I can say that I did it you know and I'm really proud of that and really thankful for that. And, um, yeah, so if you're still listening to this here this long, you know, I hope that you, uh, yeah, ask these questions of yourself. Is there something else you wish that you were doing with your life? Because similar to Hamilton and similar to Tick, Tick, Boom, we really do not know what tomorrow, you know, is going to bring. You don't know what's going to happen. It could be an aneurysm. It could be, even if it doesn't happen to you. When you lose a family member or you lose a best friend, that changes you and that shapes you and that steals time away from your life too. Even if you're technically quote unquote okay, anything can happen in life. So if things are going good for you, you know, ask the ask what you know what matters to you in life. And uh, hopefully, either my personal stories or this movie um, makes you reflect on those things, and uh, maybe you can find you know the most positive path for you. That is going to do it for this episode of No Trailers Allowed. If you are enjoying the podcast, please like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube and rate and review the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. I'd really appreciate it. If you want to find more episodes, you can visit my website, superjersh.com. If you want to support me and get the podcast early and ad-free, uh, I'm over on patreon.com slash superjersh. The video version is on youtube.com slash superjersh as well. If you want to follow me on social media, my social media on Twitter and Instagram are both at superdersh. Uh, and my email address for this show is no trailers allowed at gmail.com if you want to be a uh, part of the show with your questions, comments, or suggestions. As always, thank you for watching or listening. Until next time.